Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I think that was record time for announcements. Anyway. <laughs> Proverbs 23 and 23. You know, I've noticed uh, women like to go shopping. They do. So this this uh, this verse ought to intrigue them. <laughs> I'm getting the stink eye from in this room right now, but uh, amen. If you're in Proverbs 23 and 23, say amen. amen. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Lord, we're so thankful for your word tonight. Lord, I'm but clay and I'm but dust. I pray that your word would go forth, Lord, with unction, edification, and anointing into ears, hearts, minds, souls, and spirit to receive it. Lord, that we would truly know you, God, walk with you in a very special anointed way in these last days. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. The writer of Proverbs didn't just emphasize buying the truth. He took it a step further and, start, and stated with just as much emphasis that we are never to sell it. Truth is not for sale. Biblical truth cannot be bought or, in a better sense, sold. It's not for sale, just as Simon in Acts 18 and 18. And in spite of what many say, Jesus spent quite a bit of time talking and speaking about or even mentioning stewardship, finances, and money. We tend to buy things, a lot of things. It's, it's, it's hard to really live, especially in America, without having something on your list to go buy. I'm blown away at how much stuff I have and how many things plague me that I need to still go get. Are you hearing me? It's amazing how quickly something can be missing from the house and you get upset saying, that's it, I'm going to get some of that tomorrow. <laughs> it's hard to go without eggs and milk around my house. And, uh, I don't know what it is like in your house. Maybe it's other things that if it's not there, it's bad. I know that uh, if we're low on coffee or we're down or we just don't have coffee, it doesn't really matter what's going on. Sister Crow will be going to get coffee. We accumulate quite a bit of stuff. In fact, we accumulate a lot of stuff. We are constantly looking at stuff. We are constantly being advertised to, and there are all kinds of needs, wants, and likes. There's an old saying that states a fool and his money are soon parted. That originates from a verse of scripture in Proverbs 21.20. It says, there is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. Jesus speaks about money. There's a few parables, and I want to just touch on these to get your mind thinking about the truth. Uh, in Luke 12, 16 through 20, there's a rich man worrying about more about where to store his stuff that he didn't concern himself with his own soul. And Jesus, speaking the parable, said, he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He's got a lot. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided or hast bought? Pilate was in a socially tight squeeze that we know of and was speaking ironically to Jesus when he makes a statement that should arrest us in our spirit, especially those that 
are in a truthful walk with God. It says in John 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? He was looking at it right in the eye and didn't even realize the value of it. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto him, unto them, I find no fault at all. He had the truth in front of him. He found no fault. But even though he found no fault in the truth, he wouldn't buy it because he thought more about appeasing the crowd than getting to know the truth. In the English Standard Version, Pro version Proverbs says, by truth, do not sell it, by wisdom, instruction, and understanding. So Pilate went on to basically sell Jesus in order for there to be peace with the crowd. I wonder how peaceful Pilate is right now. It's really a stark picture that we live every day. Will you live to have peace with the crowd and silence Jesus? Or will you choose Jesus and let the crowd condemn? Some of us have to make this decision in our own, in our own homes. The struggle's not just with people, it's with ourselves and our value system. In fact, Jesus in Mark 10 in beginning at verse 21, then Jesus beholding him loved him. He looked at this young man and loved him. Listen, folks, listen to me tonight. And said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast. I like that because there's no confusion in that. Nothing that you have is more valuable than what you need to buy and give to the poor. That stops many of us because we get a hierarchy mentality when we've exceeded or, or succeeded in a, a level that there are people financially or socially beneath us. We don't mind giving up because we can expect to receive, but we don't like giving down because the expectation. There's some moral stuff here that we have to deal with and navigate. And give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. He told him. He handed him the truth. And come, take up the cross. Wait a minute. I will start giving to the poor was taking up the cross. I will stop giving away the things of the world that I make gain Christ is the cross. It's not. Anybody know how to take care of your finances? <laughs> we struggle because we, we, we think that when we deny ourselves, that that's the cross. It's not. It's kindergarten. It's kindergarten math. That's just putting Christ where he belongs. Take up your cross and follow me. And it says, and he was sad at that saying, why would I give my stuff to the poor? Turn and follow you, Jesus. Many aren't sad at that, we're grieved and won't do it. And he went away grieved for he had great possessions. He had a, a lot of stuff he bought. I'm still talking about truth right now. But we're all buying something. We're all selling something. Mark chapter 12, and there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more 
than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. We all know what that feels like. Transparency tells me that just about every time I put something in the offering. Didn't hurt. Didn't hurt. When she put this in, it hurt. It hurt. I fall in the wrong category in the scripture. Cast in of their abundance, but she of her want. Notice there's things that we need, want, and like. She was empty. Cast in all that she had, even all her living. I'm confident in reading these to you and your hearing tonight that the young man who walked away sorrowfully would have not only have sold four times what he had, but possibly, and I'm sure even more, if he could be given another opportunity for that question. I'm pretty sure he, he'd love a do-over. Hindsight's 2020, but God is looking at us to have faith because faith is foresight in believing and having faith in God. And I'm sure the widow does not regret the moment she put everything she had in and had to go away hungry. I'd like to jump up and down and tell you I'm right there, but I've struggled with that. Are you hearing me? Buying the truth. Buying the truth takes wisdom. Buying the truth takes wisdom and it takes wisdom to keep it because you have to have understanding to value it. In other words, Esau sold his birthright. birthright. Our new birth is valuable. If you have wisdom, it'll hold its value. If you have understanding, you'll never sell it. Esau lacked wisdom. It was so much so in Hebrews chapter 12. In the New Testament, it talks about follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness. You know that root of bitterness? It's hard to give when you think you're owed. Let me say it this way. It's hard to give when you think you've earned. The Bible tells us God gives us the strength to work. We get kind of high and mighty when we achieve and earn in this world. But if God was to take away the breath, take away the strength, uh, take away your mind, take away those things that we th they think we think are ours. Anybody ever seen someone get sick with a deb deb debilitating disease? Except for the grace of God, there we go. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness. We get trouble with the buying of the truth, with going all in. Because sometimes our roots are in the wrong things. I deserve, I've earned, I got a right, I'm something here. I've achieved something on this planet. Yet when Jesus talks about lay your treasure where moth and rust don't, it's an invisible thing. It's hard for me to walk around and gloat about what you can't see. It's hard to trip over spiritual success. <laughs> but we trip over our physical. We drive down the road in a nice car and we look across, oh man, look at that jalopy. We pull up to our house, and that's right. Put on a nice set of clothes and nice shoes and clean underwear, and we think, yeah. But yet God sees through all the facade. I don't know if Sister Bruce was elbowing you about your clean underwear or not, brother. <laughs> Listen, 
lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau. How do you get so? Let me tell you, I'm going to say something. You can, there's a, the Old Testament used a word called apostasy when God's people would turn away from him. But in the New Testament, we have a new because we're the bride of Christ. And if we're to be the bride of the groom, when you were to go ahead and do things that are not beneficial to the groom, you're committing spiritual adultery. You can't tell me it wouldn't hurt pretty quick if you found out your spouse valued something more than you. But how many times... And our American attitude, do we do that? Are you hearing me? And Esau is being kind of thrown under the, the bus here because he, for one morsel of meat, sold his birthright. But he was hungry. But Jesus said, those that are hungry and thirst have to rise. What stops people from growing in Lord in the Lord? What you hunger and thirst for. For you know that afterward, he, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, so he sought it carefully with, with tears. There's something precious about truth. It is an, it, it is, it's become rare today in this world. Truth doesn't glitter like gold or precious jewels. It's not coveted like popularity or finances, yet it's the key to eternity. Truth doesn't have a price tag because depending on who you are and where you're at, you might have to sell everything to attain it. Truth is one of the foundational principles of God's kingdom because God is truth. Psalms 119 and 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Psalms 117 and 2, For his merciful kindness is great reward to us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Take note that there is truth, facts, and then there is the truth. Revelation. A tire is round. Truth. There is one God. Revelation. The grass is green. Truth. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. Revelation. We're talking about buying the truth. The word in English and Greek is normally the same, but the context of the statement shows us that many times in Scripture when we refer to the truth, the meaning is not merely ethical truth, but truth in all its fullness and scope as embodied, embodied in Jesus Christ. He was the perfect expression of truth. John 18, 37, to this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. I'm going to use this term in reservation. Other religions convey or attempt to point to a way to truth. But Jesus says, I am the truth. John 14 and 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Throughout scripture and until our present day, many people have a problem with truth. In fact, it's not politically correct today to say that there is even such a thing as an absolute truth. Stanley Grants, who's now passed away, made a statement that truth is relative to the community in which the person participates. And since there are many human communities, there are also necessarily many different truths. Thomas Helmbach states, every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyles, and perception of truth claims are equal. There is no hierarchy of truth. Your beliefs and my beliefs are equal and all truth is relative. 
that view is propagated and often pushed in such statements that we hear all the time. No one has a right to tell me what's right or wrong. It's wrong to impose your beliefs or morals on someone else. Pay attention. I have the right to do whatever I want if I'm not hurting anyone. You have to do what you think is right. You have your value system and I have mine. I don't feel the same way. Look, that's your opinion. These views are not the exception today, even among Christians. An extensive study revealed that even 57% of Christian youth already believe that what is wrong for one person is not necessarily the wrong for somebody else. Nearly 80% of 18 to 34 year olds believe there is no unchanging ethical standard of right and wrong. It is not, not enough today to live and let live. It's not enough to assert another person's right to believe or say what he thinks is right. In order to be truly tolerant, you must now give your approval, your endorsement, and support to their belief and behaviors. It's mandated. That that's what they say truth is. That's how just this last week, California weakened sexual misconduct with minors. Because now they're trying to propagate and say that, well, some people can't help being pedophiles. They have their rights. It started with all this other things. Mm -hmm. Let me just put it this way. And God created a woman for the man. He didn't create a man for the man. He didn't create a woman for a woman. He created a woman for a man. That's what the Bible says. That's the truth of the word of God. Understand also, Oregon just legalized psychedelic drug possession. Because somebody else has what they're saying, a different truth. Sell that to the family who just completely gets mutilated and killed in a car crash because someone's completely gone and having a psychedelic dream on mushrooms driving down the road. They think that's okay. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. I don't agree with that truth. Are you hearing me? The United Nations Declaration of Principles on Tolerance. Tolerance involves a rejection of dogmaticism and absolutism. Listen to this. Isn't it ironic that the proponents of the new tolerance are so dogmatic about dogmaticism and so absolute in their opposition of ap absolutism? You know, what that, you know what that says? You got to see it our way or no way. That's what they say. In other words, any system that believes in absolute truth is by definition guilty of intolerance. You don't even have to say anything. If you even think there's an absolute truth, then you're intolerant. They don't want us to be able to say the Bible is right. The Bible is true. To the modernist, non-agreement is phobia. Non-conformity is haste, hate. And conviction is fanaticism. That is why the proponents of tolera toleration have no problem being intolerant towards Christians because we believe in a biblical truth, one God, man's sinfulness, and the evangelism of, of other faiths. We need to reach other people. Well, wait a minute. Traditional tolerance asserts that everyone has an equal right to believe or say what he thinks is right. But the new tolerance says that what every individual believes or says is equally as right. All values are equal. All lifestyles are equal. All truth claims are equal. But the law of non-contradiction non or basic logic insists that two contradictory ideas cannot both be true. There's someone right and there's someone wrong. Are you hearing me? Now, one religion, I'm not going to name any names, believes that when a soul dies, it becomes reincarnated in another form. And they want to put that on the same level as other religions that assert that a soul spends eternity in heaven or hell. These are not equally true. The Bible makes it clear that all values, beliefs, lifestyles, and truth claims are not equal. It teaches that the God of the Bible is the true God, Jeremiah 10 and 10, but the Lord is the true God. 
He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. That all his words are true, Psalms 119 and 160. Thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. And that if something is not right in God's sight, then it's wrong. So I'll, even I can see how anti-biblical ideology sounds good. And it sounds good that I can be right, even if I'm wrong. Because my feelings. It even sounds empowering until you realize the sinister, the sinister, sinister side of being on the wrong side of God. Did you hear what I said? God forbid, Romans 3 and 4, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, thou, thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. What's the first thing you hear when you try to lay down some truth, biblical truth? You're judging me. Let me tell you what that is. You're driving down the road. And your wife's speeding and driving around because you're trying to say, hey, listen, you're driving too fast. You need to slow down. You're judging me. No, I'm right. You're wrong. Slow down. Bam! You get pulled over. Cop gets you. You got to go before a... You were speeding. Sadly, some people wait to get before the judge before they do what's right. So the spirit of the new tolerance has in great measure infiltrated the church in the last days. That's why you can have people, got a very dear friend right now going through some horrible stuff. You can go to any church you want to, but if you're not obeying the truth, you're not right with God. You're not. You can't have your truth and they have their truth and God has his truth and everybody's okay. No. I don't care if you're going to church. I don't care if you're going to synagogue. I don't care if you're going to a shrine. It doesn't matter. People have a false idea that all interpretation of Scripture are equal. And to tell someone their belief and behavior is wrong is being judgmental. But the Bible contains absolute truth. There's a hierarchy and there's an order. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. You know, you don't hear anybody talking about demon possession in the Old Testament. But you see a whole lot of it in the New Testament because there's been a transition from the old to the new. People are now territory. So when you think you're just acting up and you got your own way against the word of God, ah, you become territory of the enemy. You can bark and fight and spit all the truth that you think you got, but let God be true in every man. Ain't. So the question is not what does it mean to me? What does it mean there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism? What does it mean that the husband is the head of the house? What does it mean we need to be baptized in Jesus' name? I understand the wheel is round. That's truth. But I also understand there's one God. That's revelation. So if the word of God says something, that's not subject to our interpretation. That's revelatory truth. Obey them and have rule over you. How, 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 can a, how can a husband and a wife tell the children you need to obey because I'm the parent and then they not submit one to another because they're married. You're not married because of a piece of paper. You're married because of an agreement. You can't be a Christian because you because of a piece of paper. You have to be uh, married to God and be a Christian because of your obedience to truth, your agreement. The meaning of the Bible is decided is not decided by the reader, but, by, but is discerned by the reader. Notice in Acts 8, verse 30 and 31, and I need to hurry. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Listen, you can divide a quantity without hurting it, but you destroy an entity when you divide it. Notice Solomon when they brought the baby and he was going to split it in half. The king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one, half to the other. Regardless of the opinions of men, truth stands on its own. Truth does not suffer when we fight against it. We suffer. 
When you disobey God, you bring in confusion, you bring suffering into your home, you bring suffering to your family, but most of all, you bring suffering to yourself. God isn't suffering. The Word isn't suffering. The church isn't suffering. You're suffering. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 10 and 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. You can't love, say you love God and disobey his Bible. You can't love God and turn around and cause problems in your home and your family. You can't, it's impossible. He said, how can you love him who you can't see when you're not loving the man you're or the woman you're married to? That makes you a liar because God is truth. Are you hearing me? And it says, and for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion. Not a delusion, a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. How dare you purposely go against the word of God and wound and hurt and thrive in unrighteousness. You'll have your reward. Galatians 5 and 7 says, you did run well. Who did hinder that ye should not obey the truth? 1 Timothy 2 and 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? 2 Corinthians 13 8, for we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. The apostolic church is often criticized as being inflexible and out of step with modern times. This perception is false, but quite common. The problem is that we are in step with truth, and not only will we not move from it, we can't move from it. Romans 8, 1 and 2, there is, thou, there is therefore now no condemnation to to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Listen, what did that say? I'm not free from the law. I'm free from the law of sin and death. And how do I, how, how do I get free from worrying about going to hell? I'm obeying truth and righteousness. Not because I call myself a Christian and I attend a church while I'm creating hell and havoc in the world. Truth makes you free from the law of sin and death. If he at the Son is set free, is free indeed. 1 Timothy 3, 15. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You ever notice how people that get obstinate towards the church. What? What do you want me to do? I'm not angry. I'm not mad. Okay. You know, I, do, I read the Bible. You're not doing it against me. You're doing it against him. Good luck with that. You know? You ever... We all, we all, we've all seen it. We've all known. We've all said the word karma before because something we say, we really shouldn't say karma. Bible talks about it, you reap what you sow. That clown that ridiculous gets around you, winds you, and then you know, a mile up the road, you see him wrecked or pulled over on the side of the road. <laughs> That's just a small microcosm. Of what's going to happen in the end of the world? Where it's like you did all you wanted to do, but you were told we weren't judging. We weren't being gentle. We were being loving. You were the one being unloving. You were be the one untruthful and unscriptural, right? Instructing themselves. If God prevention will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now you're learning how powerful repentance is because it takes repentance to acknowledge the truth. It takes saying, you know what? I got to repent. I'm doing wrong here. And if you can continue to do wrong, the truth is not in you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Galatians 4, 16. I am, am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. In today's world, there is such a hatred for biblical truth that even the senator, certain senators attacked Amy Coney Barrett for her faith and beliefs and her understanding, and they actually involved her relationship with her husband. I'm telling this to you, church, because there's a time coming you better have bought this truth. And you better not be, uh, I don't care what they promise to take. 
what they promise to destroy, nothing needs to be more valuable to you than this. Get ready because there's fast approaching a time when the choice to serve God will cost more than just verbal attacks. Right is always right. Two plus two is always going to be four. Wrong is always going to be free. Two plus two is whatever I say it is. You ever notice that? That people that just won't really live for God, they have a former, it's whatever, they're, they're different from day to day. You know, a dog with a collar indicates that somebody cares. Buy the truth and sell it not. So how do you buy the truth? So fixing to bring this too close. I want to just give you a few examples. Abraham lets us know, buy it publicly. Genesis 23 and 13, he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, but if thou will give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. David shows us to buy it wholeheartedly. And the king said to Aruna, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord God of that which cost me nothing. That bothers, that bothers me. Because it's so easy to put money in the offering or to do things for God that don't hurt. The week of prayer and fasting. I can be, be here on the days that it don't hurt me to be here. I can be faithful on Sundays and Wednesdays and when it doesn't hurt me to be faithful. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I can be a Christian as long as they don't cuss me. But if they cuss me, I'm cussing back. I'm going to believe this truth all the way until, wait a minute, what do you mean now I can't work? So David bought the threshing floor in the auction for 50 shekels of silver, wholeheartedly, all in. Jeremiah lets us, us know to buy it unconditionally. Jeremiah 32 and 8. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, buy my field, I pray thee. That is an Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word. Let's stand. I want to close, and I'm just going to read two verses of this parable that Jesus used to answer this question, to answer the honesty of our human struggle today. Let's be honest. As a group, great. But as an individual, each and every one of us has to make the decision. And we've made it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. We all want the best. We want the best deal. I don't know that a month goes by that Erica doesn't let me know. Hey, there's a sale over here. You need to be. Nothing wrong with that. We want the best deal. We're always buying things. We're always accumulating things. How, most of us get up every day because there's something you have to go and get that day. You can call it barter. You can call it buying. But we're trading time and life for things. When you look back at your life, you're going to find that what you got for yourself is, is, is amazingly so much more than what you give to God. It's the struggle of our nature. It's like I said, we really don't live for eternity. Why is it that we become so much aware when maybe something, a diagnosis, 
or a loved one passes away that we realize our mortality. I'm going to read this again. Again, Jesus is trying to get a point to everybody. I don't care how old you are or young you are. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearl. This is what he's doing. This is the point of his existence. This is what he does. This is why he's alive. Who? When he found one pearl of great price. When he finally found the most important precious pearl that has ever been. When he sold all that he had. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Are you all in? Are you all in? Dr. James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family, shared a story once. While he was in college, his goal was to become a school tennis champion. He worked hard. He trained hard. And he actually succeeded in becoming the champion. He felt so proud when his, tri when, his, when his trophy was prominently placed in the school's trophy case. Years later, someone mailed in the trophy. They let, sent him a note with it and said, you know, we found this in the trash bin. The school was undergoing renovation works and someone threw it away. James Dobson says, given enough time, all your trophies will be trashed by someone else. The only thing that lasts is what we do for him and because of him. We're really not put on earth to be remembered. We're put here to prepare for eternity. We're going to see him one day and give an account of our lives. Rudyard Kipling, one of those who know him as an author, advised a group of students not to make money, power, or fame their goals because one day, they would meet the one who did not care for any of these things. And then you'll realize how poor you were. Buy the truth. Sell it not. You're your own merchant man. You're buying or selling in your life. Ask yourself honestly. Are you buying the truth? Many of us, in fact, most of us, it's hard to live very long, have experienced yourself in a financial bind. Even if it's been a long time, we've all felt it. We've all felt the, the need, the hunger, the thirst, the pang for something beyond us. And saying all that, and it's easy to be thinking about the things of the world, but I am thankful that God set before us an open door. That you don't buy this with monetary. He who has the most toys wins jack all. But he who gives his life for Christ buys the truth and wins. Amen. Think about this. Let, this. let this word, this thought tonight, let these scriptures marinate. Allow it to affect your thought life, your perspective. When you get up in a hurry because you think you need this or that, come on, we're coming on the Thanksgiving season and the Christmas season. 
I can honestly say that one of the greatest Christmases I ever had was the one, the year we moved to England and we were in the process of getting a home and all that and money was so tight. My dad was working crazy hours and uh, there just wasn't much. It was just poor timing. But we spent time together around the fireplace. Gifts weren't exchanged. We were glad to all to be all being together as a family. There's a day coming when we'll all gather around the throne. The family of God. <laughs> Nothing on this world will ever compare to that. Remember that. He's gone to prepare a place for us. That where he is, we can be also. I say tonight, by the truth.